John Stoddart, growing up in Liverpool, um, when did photography first come into your, your thinking? Well, I remember being, a, like, as a schoolboy, I developed some rolls of film. I had a little box brownie type camera, which I bought from Boots the Chemist, and it, I sort of liked the hobby, but it purely was that. And I was very young, I must have been about 13. Um, and then I forgot all about it, uh, literally, it didn't enter my mind. And then it wasn't until I joined the army when I was 15 and uh, we moved to, we were stationed in Hong Kong when it was still a British colony. And I just got into it as a hobby then while I was in the army. The images that I've seen from your f fledgling career mm. in photography start around about 81. Yeah. So yeah. It, did you come out of the army and go into the photography education or anything like no, that? No, not, none at all, um, but very keen amateur. The social documentary work that you mm. did in, in Liverpool in 81, I think 81, 82. Yeah, and 83. About, and 83. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? And yeah, you well, I was, very, about? yeah, I was very influenced by um, people like William Klein and his type of photojournalism. And there was lots of upheaval, incredible upheaval at that time. It was the Thatcher years. And I would go out and photograph all over Liverpool, but mainly in the district of Everton. And I just got in with them on. I used to go out every day and, and photograph all these amazing scenes, people really. Uh, I would say almost impossible to do now, particularly taking pictures of children. Uh, and also, I was getting in with some rock and roll bands as friends, and I would do pictures of them. And some of the quality music press, the enemy, the face and things like that, sounds, they would start saying, oh, could you send us some of them pictures you did? So I'd be like a northern correspondent. So it sort of grew like that. Frankie Goes to Hollywood features it, quite a lot yeah, in, your, I knew all in of the them. early 80s. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew all of them as friends. They were quite a crazy bunch, but good fun. And there was other bands like Echo and the Bunny Men, and there was, people might not remember, but uh, Pete Wiley from, from War. You know, really, he was very successful for a, a while. And then one day, um, it, I had a studio at this point, um, but we were just, the, the un unemployment in Liverpool was so severe, even though I was classed as employed now, as a freelance photographer, I was basically unemployed because no one had any money. Mm. And the studio I had was lovely. I was in a partnership with someone. And one day, my wife and I, we just said, we're going and we'll have to go to London. And this was in 1985. There are many pictures we could talk about, and I've just chosen a random one just, yeah. just to kick off with. Tilda Swinton. Mm. Um, it's a, to me, it's a, it's a very early example of a John Stoddart, the yeah. style, the yeah. production value, yeah. um, the, the interesting background. Is that 5'4"? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and so can you tell us a little bit about yeah, how well, that came that's about? Yeah, I'm glad you brought yeah. that up, because that is still one of my favourite pictures. It? Yeah. And after time and my age, I can detach myself from me taking that picture and I can enjoy looking at it mm. and what it represented. And it's, it goes alongside another shot you may have seen of Dexter Fletcher. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah. taken on the same week. Really? And it was for the film Caravaggio by the, the great Derek Jarman. The backdrop I hired, that the guy used to do for the Opera House, the leaves come from Hyde Park Corner, which I gathered that morning. And she wore that suit with the, from a circus, which was she bought for $100 in New York. I started using these very deliberately false, I wanted them to look false, think Joshua Reynolds type. So it's these type of backgrounds where you don't, you're not meant to think they're real. Um, and I use them a lot. What I would do is I, I would put people in situations to almost as if they could play a role and it wasn't just a headshot of someone. Yeah. So, so it's an early, early example of sort of theatrical settings that yeah. you were creating. Yeah. And we'll talk about some others yeah. later. But and you, but by now, mid eighties, you were developing that stod art style. Yeah, uh, and maybe the continuous light might have helped that style. Yeah, formats that you were choosing. 
And then you, somehow, I don't know, you please tell us, how did you come to meet Vivian Westwood and, uh, and John Galliano and yeah, so on? Yeah, well, that, that again, I think they're, uh, I think they're 87 or so, yeah. I think. Um, again, because you're just moving around in the right circles. Um, Galliano had just left college, St. Martin's. Vivian Westwood, I live quite close to her shop. I got to know her. She'd left her punk image behind in, in her first collection. And Galliano, the, the pictures I did then were, were his very first collection, and he was breathtaking to work with. But I, I know he's had controversy, but he was a smashing fella for me to work with, and Vivian. There wasn't that many photographers around. I mean, you, colleges weren't doing courses or anything for them. Now they're turning them out, and they end up working in a camera shop. You know, very few of them are taking photographs. Whereas when I was in London, especially into the 90s, there was literally a handful of us doing everything. And I um, you know, started to get a good reputation, yeah. you know, if you're dealing with sort of major Hollywood um, film stars or yeah. top-notch rock and rollers, yeah. you know, that you've got to get it right. Yeah. And one of those was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Uh, around yeah. about that time, actually. Yeah, it was um, one of the Terminator movies. And uh, he was a real gent, actually, very nice man. And um, I asked him to, he was in a tracksuit, and I asked him to get changed and he put a suit on and he got it straight away that we were doing something different. And if you look at the pictures, they're very cinematic. He looks like he's in a role, particularly them bed shots with the yeah. trashed bed. Continuous light. Yeah, yeah, not yeah, flash. yeah, yeah, yeah. Soon after that, um, you had a, a, a very big studio session with the Rolling Stones. And, yeah. and before we get into that, when you, when you knew that was in the diary, um, you may not have known for very long, I don't know, but. How do you start to think and prepare to, to photograph that, you know, mega rock? It's the first time they'd been together for a shoot for quite a few years. Okay. Um, and it was, it was quite a, um, it, I wouldn't say nerve wracking, but because when they arrived, they arrived with quite an entourage. Mm. Um, they all had their own manager, girlfriends, wives, pet dogs. We, we put up like four backdrops, so we just moved the band around and obviously yeah. we had to do solo pictures. Yeah. Um, so it was quite a big shoot. So the preparation was quite uh, extensive. It always is. I always uh, prep is everything. Mm. Taking the pictures is the fun bit. The preparation is where you get it all right. So there's no. You mustn't let anyone see you're struggling to find no. an idea. Yep. It's all been done. Yeah. Out of the the Stones uh, session, um, there was a portrait of Charlie Watts that yes, um, yep. that, that has um, become probably iconic uh, now that you took that day. Um, and it's really become into the public consciousness since he died. That shot you're referring to, it's, um, I always liked it anyway. There's something poignant about it and the pose. And he was such an elegant man, beautifully dressed all the time. And, um, and when that, that picture went viral, you know, from the New York Times to the Stones themselves used it um, when they did the tour, and it was everywhere. The Happy Mondays, John, and uh, Bez and his arm. Oh, what yeah. What a picture. Quite crazy. They were sort of really on a roll then. And um, Bez had had a, a look, looked like a pretty t awful injury to his arm. And um, they forced in the band to take his shirt off. And um, I asked him about it. And it, 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 it got gangrene in Jamaica where they were, recorded the album. And it, they had to break his arm. Uh, I don't know the medical details, obviously, and that, that horrendous uh, device was put on his arm. But he, he sort of liked it and did a little dance with it on. And, you know, he's, that's all he ever did, I think. Amazing, but amazing, yeah, amazing yeah, that, was a, that was a good rock and roll shoot, that one. Yeah, yeah. And Catherine Zeta-Jones. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you did quite a lot of work with Catherine. More uh, than anyone. Uh, more, okay. And did she uh, approach you? or? Yeah, I think so. Or we may have met again through a commission from a magazine. Um, and we were neighbours, she lived across the street. She was great, you know, she was full of life. And she'd done, a th I think, a couple of small film parts, but it was the TV series, The Darling Buds of May. And she said to me, uh, and it, she was at her height TV-wise, and she said, John, I've, I've, I've got to get out of this image. I want to be a Hollywood star. Will you photograph me? And I said, okay. So I did, I photographed her like a Hollywood star. And six months later, she was a Hollywood star. She went there exactly. and, and, you know, she never looked back. No. And uh, 
anyone who sees those photographs can see the production value, yeah, um, yeah. It, 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 the, the, the quality of the photography, but also the clothing, the location, yeah. I think it was the Dorchester, Dorchester Hotel. Hotel. The, the, this becomes part of your DNA, doesn't it? Yeah. The style. By going to hotels, I became known as a hotel photographer. Uh, that's why I wear suits, because you, you, you know, you're going into a five-star hotel. And um, what, what I found really useful, one, it had a strong cinematic feel to the whole shoot, mm. but also it gave my subject something to do. So they're not just against a white background or a gray background. They're, there's a role for them to play. Yeah. And going on about the production values, I'm glad you picked that up because that's absolutely true. It's vital to all of my photos, 99% of them. What, what people often don't get is that standing right next to me, the uh, ultra professional hairdressers, makeup artists, stylists, um, maybe the client, maybe someone from the photo desk, you know, it, so they were all there to make that person look magnificent. And so there was never, you know, we didn't know what to do. It's all been worked out. But in terms of versatility, you could easily be doing a photo shoot with a model in lingerie in the Dorchester Hotel and the next day be photographing John Le Carrier. Yeah, yeah, well that, that would be very, it was, I, to this day, I loved the, the you know, I, I could go to St. Petersburg with Prime Minister Blurt, meet Putin, the only photographer allowed to go. And at the same time, do um, a lingerie campaign when I come back, mm. you know, type thing yeah. like that. It was always yeah. incredibly versatile, mm. which was great, because it kept me on my toes. I never got bored. No. Uh, James Bond was a uh, uh, two James Bonds actually, yeah. but that that uh, was a big big part of your '90s experience. Yeah, I I worked with Pierce Brosnan on his first Bond and Die Another Day. I think I did some on that, but the Golden Eye film was you know a great a great game changer for everyone involved. He's a lovely man. He's I always say he's probably one of the nicest people I've ever photographed. But it, I remember that day like it was yesterday, 1995. It was fantastic, you know, and th those pictures are coming into their own again, you know, they're, they're bit, because a lot of them, are, you know, that you've got and people are seeing now were not shown at the time. Uh, Piers has a whole set, he, 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 I, I did them a whole set, he loved them, and there's a, one, one of my favourite sessions, really. Yeah, the two girls. Uh, they were terrific, you know. Yeah. The girl said to me, she said, look, John, when we're on the film, man, this is film, when we're at the end, give us a nod, because we want to have a bit of fun with our man. Bond and I said like right everyone this is the last role and that's when they attacked him and it's a I use it as a, a large contact sheet and it's yeah. so popular because it's it's n nothing like any Bond before and he's yeah. everyone's having fun in it yeah. I've got the serious ones but that was great yeah and uh, and whilst we're on the subject then let's talk about Daniel Craig as yeah. well yeah yeah uh, so, uh, I mean that's uh, several years later yeah, several years later, but he wasn't Bond then. He was. He got it though. He. I think he. He just made a film, Layer Cake, a particular favourite picture of mine, male wise, and you couldn't get more simple than that picture. And it's one of those photographs of both men, and I wonder why women like. Um, he looks so cool in it, and it's the simplest picture imaginable. It's taken in the Royal Court Theatre in Chelsea. Uh, not in the th 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 they, they would let me use the common areas in the daytime mm. as a little studio. Uh, and he just looks great in that. And we all know history after how he became a Bond and everything else. But um, there's something edgy about that picture. He looks hungry in it. I've got a few favourites. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm curious to know how they came about. Yeah. So look, Sting um, from the police fame. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, the Sting one, that's great. He was a really nice fella to work with. We did it down in his beautiful house. He's got this Elizabethan house like you wouldn't believe. He's got a river goes through, the, through it with fish in it. Um, and I took the handcuffs with me um, just as an idea. He loved it. He said, yeah, let's do it. So I handcuffed him and photographed him. And he looks good as well. He's in good shape. Sometimes you, you said you had uh, half a day with the Rolling Stones and that's quite a long time. Yeah. But that's not normal, I don't think. Uh, and uh, there's a set of pictures of Martin Scorsese, yeah. which was taken, I think, in a hotel suite somewhere. Yeah. Did you have very long to do those? Uh, well, I in unintentionally did. It was taken in Claridge's. And like a lot of these, they have, a, I can't remember his, his fake name, because you are, go to the reception, okay. you know, and you ask, and they go, oh, yes, and he's waiting for you. So I went to his room, um, beautiful suite in Claridge's, 
and he, he, he got me tea, it was afternoon tea, with cakes and little sandwiches. And he said, do you want to watch this movie with me? I really, I said, oh, right, okay. What is it? And it was Clarence the Cross-Eyed Lion. He knew who the cameraman was, he knew everything about it. I just was amazed. He'd so you had an afternoon tea and watched a movie yeah, together? Yeah, and uh, then to how, how long did the photography actually take? About 40 minutes. Okay. You, you had to go and photograph Ronnie Cray's funeral. I mean, yeah. this is again, probably all in a day's work to John Stoddart, mm. having done all your early stuff in Liverpool, the social documentary mm. and everything. That is true. See, in other words, that Liverpool very early days on the streets never left me. Me and my assistant, we dressed in black, black suit, black tie, and we just went along with the entourage. It was the most amazing day, and I'm not glorifying these type of people, but I'd never seen a, a, a funeral like it. It was horse-drawn carriage. Literally thousands of people. Uh, we all had drinks in the Blind Beggar pub where he shot, killed someone. And then we went to the graveyard and we were lucky. And I, I'd got some pictures, but the picture I think you're referring to, the coffin, um, they all left. And the grave digger looks at me. He's leaning on a shovel. He went, get in there, get a shot of that. And I straddled the grave of Ronnie Cray and I shot it on a roller flex, I'll never forget. And I looked down and I could see Babs Windsor's rose there and people's little goodbye Ron and things like that. And then the grave digger just pulled it all in and that was it, over. Wow. And then mm. another portrait of Frankie Fraser, um, yeah, another well, East End. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, he was quite strange. Mm. Um, I photographed him a couple of times actually and he had his, I don't know if he was married to her, but one of the uh, the daughters of the great train robbers so they're all in it together but he was he had the battle scars all over him you can see in his face he's been beaten up a thousand times but it really playing to the gallery i photographed a couple of those hoods from the 60s and they're they're, they're very theatrical if we could just talk a little bit about the relationship with popper photo john we, yeah. uh, you and i met i think it was in 2018 was it yeah. uh, around 2018 when we were introduced to each other and yeah so w when we first met and um it was it was really a godsend really because um as much as i'd looked after my archive and you know logged it as best i could in my humble way um the world of photography was rapidly changing and suddenly there was no more negatives and I wondered what it was for and I, and I was very tempted by our relationship and because I was at the age I was I know I couldn't have done better than what I've done with you I've often said if I was in my 30s would I have done it and I think now with all the positive things that y your company has done with my work I would never have been able to do that I'm, I'm just a sole trader you know, at that point in a little seaside uh, fishing village, fishing town. So, it, yeah, it's been great. And you have opened my eyes to my own work. Work I've not forgotten, but it, I can assure you it's impossible to shoot that much in that many years. 41 years last year, I, I, opened, I walked out into the street with a camera in my hand and made a living non-stop. That's, that's not a job. That's a man's life. And it's a lifetime. So... I look at your company as the progression of that, and I've still got my, a lovely prints, and you know, my, I've, I've had stuff scanned years ago, and I can get prints done, just little prints. So, you know, it's a, a perfect solution for me, really. John Stoddart, thank you very much.